Hello everyone and welcome to this last training session, Ethics and Empathy, Health and Well-Being, hosted by ITML. Before proceeding to the agenda, let me introduce to you also myself. I am Anna Maria Anaxagora, I am Greek Cypriot but currently living in Greece. I have studied computer science and I hold a master in business administration. I am working in ITML for two years now as a project manager. We are starting today's session with fundamental ethics and the ethics in business and the workspace. The ethics and empathy training concerns online ethical behavior and interaction with others based on soft skills, such as the ability to recognize and understand the feelings and perspectives of others. This is called empathy. Empathy constitutes an essential requirement for positive online interaction and for realizing for the possibilities that the digital world affords. When we all hear about ethics, we have many words coming to our head. Most of us think about fairness, honesty, principles and many more. In this slide we can see some definitions for ethnics based on the bibliography. We all know that what we are encouraged to make ethical choices and apply ethics in all areas of our lives. Ethics is a code of moral standards of conduct for what is right as opposed to what is wrong. Morals are the habits or the behaviors with respect to what an individual believes is right or wrong. The individual performs their own ethical behavior, which is value-driven. Other common definitions are that ethics is based on well-founded standards of right and wrong which prescribe the behavior of humans, or that ethics is a branch of philosophy which seeks to address questions about morality. In general, it is supported that ethics refer to a set of principles of right conduct. It is then each person's responsibility to adapt their behavior accordingly. Among business people we can see that the term ethics changes its definition a lot. The era of the internet has introduced many new dimensions to the study and practice of ethics. Using the internet, we can cause great harm or be the victims of it, with barely noticing. Major concerns in the field of online ethics include the protection of private information, the limits of a presumed freedom of expression and issues of misrepresentation. Something we didn't mention is that ethics, as a term, has been derived from the Greek word ethos which means character or morals. When it comes to business ethics, it necessarily means following all the rules and standards set by a company or an organization. Once familiar, its code of conduct will lead us to an understanding of established morals on which the company works. In YouTube we have plenty of videos talking about ethics. Especially since COVID-19 occurred and has changed the whole remote and online philosophy. Let's watch some of them. A discussion of the work ethic brings up some very provocative questions. Do workplace ethics problems come from a lack of a work ethic? Where does your character fit into your work ethic? What is happening in our modern, global work environment that conflicts with our traditional view of the work ethic? How can we instill a good work ethic in those entering the workforce or those already in it? Of course, everyone has something to say on the topic. Everyone has a story to tell. In discussing the work ethic, there are many issues in play including cultural issues, generational issues, parenting, self-discipline, character, and many others. You need to understand that the work ethic, personal character, and ethical behavior at work are interconnected and are key factors in our professional ethical life. Why does the word morality leave most of us with an unsettled feeling? The fact is, whether we have high moral standards or not, most of us don't want to feel that someone else's morality is being pushed on us. It's simple human nature. We prefer to make our own moral decisions. But in reality, whether we know it or not, or like it or not, someone else's morality is constantly influencing our everyday decisions. In order to have any kind of meaningful dialogue on ethics, a discussion of morality must take place. One can argue that there is no such thing as ethics without morality. We need to be comfortable discussing morality in a variety of contexts and standing up for it when the time is right. Learning to make moral judgments is a significant step toward making compliance to rules an internal part of our character. The workplace is a unique setting to talk about moral decision making because some areas of the workplace are highly regulated by rules, yet others are not. We need to think about how this practically works out and how to develop skills to address the wide variety of circumstances we face each day. 
Let's see if you're an ethical person. So we're gonna look at five different ethics-based situations and you just have to think about what you do in each of them. So here we go. So would you return the shopping cart? Yes, always, and this isn't even a question. I don't get people who refuse to do so. The key to a functioning society is people putting away that cart. Only 58% return, all right. Would you cheat on a test? Yeah, I mean, this might be unpopular, but I don't think cheating on a test is bad, especially when they put so much weight on grades, like just do what you have to do, who cares? 95% of people agree, I didn't think it'd be that high. Do you recycle? Yeah, I mean, I don't get the inconvenience of that. Only 32%, okay, probably because of China and India. Is drunk driving ever justified? No. You should never be driving over 0.08, or texting for that matter, so definitely don't do that. 46% of people have done it. Okay, let's get that number down. Would you return extra change? So this depends. If it's a corporation with like big pockets, then no. But if it's like a local mom and pop shop, then I'd probably give it back. 40% return. All right, what do you guys think? Ethics matter in the workforce. People stay for leaders who they believe have their back and do the right thing behind closed doors. A CEO I worked with once, uh, we forgot to give a woman who was on military leave equity grants. And I said, well, let's just catch up and we'll give it to her the next time we do it and we'll give her more. And he stopped me dead in my tracks and said, absolutely not. We will give her some equity out of my personal grant. I said, she would never even know that we were giving the grant. And he left me with this important lesson. Our actions are important even when nobody is looking. And great leaders do the right thing even behind closed doors. He said, it's what a person does in private and not just public that makes them a great leader. So how do you lead? What kind of leader are you behind closed doors? We move on with the second part of our training, Empathy Fundamental. As mentioned earlier, empathy constitutes an essential requirement for positive online interaction and for realizing the possibilities that the digital world affords. Empathy in general is the awareness you have regarding the feelings of others. You validate them, you are genuinely curious about others and imagine yourself in their shoes, you are an active listener and discover similarities by sharing who you are as well. Let's see how the literature review is presenting and explaining empathy. Some images here presented empathy in keywords. Now what about empathy online? Or virtual empathy? The anonymity that comes with internet use can be a detriment to this growth. The networking power of the internet seems to be able to dramatically improve the collective development of empathy. It is a great flaw though, that this means of communication lacks personal connection. One might think that this removal of restrictions would only serve to break down prejudicial walls worldwide, exposing us all as undeniably connected and human. Research into the effects of the internet on interpersonal communication, however, indicates otherwise. People can show empathic responses to others online, but at the same time empathy has been declining in young people since technology-based communication has become prevalent. Displacement of face-to-face -face time by online activities would be expected to negatively impact empathic skills. Since there is little direct empirical research on this topic, the present study sought to determine the nature of the relationship between internet usage and empathy. So, I am placing here some articles that you could read, or you can use it as further reference, as empathy and online empathy produces many opinions and bibliography is really interesting. There are various articles and practices on how to be more empathetic. Use video to communicate. You can better understand a person's emotions if you see the person. If you are working from home or in a remote space, leverage online video technology to see your colleagues. Visuals provide cues for how a person is feeling or what a person is thinking. The more you see, the more hints you can pick up on to understand others. Listen. If you want to be empathetic, you have to key in on what the other person is saying, both nonverbally and verbally. Emotions can be seen and heard. You can pick up on feelings based on what the other person says and how they say it, including their tone. Listen to the other person. Recognize your emotions. When you are listening and recognizing the other person's emotions, recognize how you are feeling, as well. A really important skill to have in your relationship and in your everyday life is the ability to show empathy. In 30 seconds, let me show you why that is, and I'll also give you some examples to apply in your everyday life. Empathy adds depth to the love you feel for someone. This is because you see them for who they are, not what you imagine or hope they'll become. And being empathetic is the best way to help them move on with an issue. 
You see it all the time. Solutions on their own don't work until they feel validated first. For example, let's say they're upset because they didn't get a good grade on their last test. First, listen to what they're saying to you. What's their mood like and what's contributing to it? If you have a solid idea but aren't really sure, make sure to ask. It makes sense. You can't help them or offer them solutions unless you know exactly what it is they're going through. Finally, accept what they're saying and stay curious. When they're sharing with you, accept their truth. Feelings are just the brain communicating a need. It's how they genuinely feel, so you have no right to tell them they're feeling the wrong way. Empathy does not mean you get sad when they get sad. It simply means you can understand and accept why they're sad and when they're feeling that way. You got this. Last exercise in our today's training is a scenario that is testing in the most ethics and empathy online training sessions. For our male students, please consider this example with male names. Let's move on to the last part of this session, which is about health and well-being. Health and well-being relate to the fact that digital citizens inhabit both virtual and real spaces. For this reason, the basic skills of digital competence alone are not sufficient. In a digitally rich world, health and well-being imply being aware of challenges and opportunities that can affect wellness, including but not limited to online addiction, ergonomics and posture, and excessive use of digital and mobile devices. Every point of our health and well-being is linked to our mental health. Our nutrition, physical activity, sleep, financial stability and social connection all have high impact on our mental health. So, firstly, I am sure that all we know why health is important for our life. We know how pillars of physical health are connected in a way. Health and well-being in terms. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity and that's came up from the World Health Organization. The state of being happy, healthy, or prosperous. One recently interesting statement I found is the definition of well-being and how it is connected to being kind and giving. So, within our today's training as we mentioned, health and well-being relate to the fact that digital citizens inhabit both virtual and real spaces. However, is a high need of people to obtain a set of attitudes, skills, values and knowledge that render them more aware of issues related to health and well-being. And as we see, press space gia na emphanistii h icona. One statement is, and here comes a very intelligent diagram of how we defining digital health and well-being. Press again, firstly we can see that is based in four significant factors, mental well-being, emotional well-being, physical well-being and social well-being. What is digital wellness? Digital wellness, also known as digital well-being, is technology's ideal state where it works in harmony with users' physical and mental health. It's a key ingredient for a positive employee experience. Why is digital wellness important? With all the incredible benefits we gain from technology, the drawbacks of an always-on society are equally plentiful. 24-7 connectivity is, ironically, making us less connected to what's actually important. The accelerated shift towards a remote workforce has exacerbated our use of technology. With less structured boundaries, employees are becoming increasingly digitally dependent, resulting in productivity distractions and perpetual connectivity and decision fatigue. 67% of Quartz research respondents said they felt they had to be always on, while a Gallup poll showed two-thirds of workers have experienced burnout. In order to ensure employees are happy, healthy, and productive, it is vital that companies enable digital wellness. To enable digital wellness, employers should implement policies that encourage a healthy work-life integration and carefully select technology that will add value to the employee and simplify workflows. Key attributes technology should offer employees are 1. Productivity. Tech should set controls for scheduling, blocking times, and silencing notifications. 2. Mobility. Tech should enable better flexibility for employees to work securely, when and where they need to, on personal devices. 3. Automation. Tech should automate administrative tasks and optimize workflow. I am posting here some articles for personal reference. Your mental health and your well-being is the most important thing in the world. Nobody else is going to maintain that for you because everybody else is focused on their own. If you want to spend as long on this planet as humanly possible, you need to create a good environment for yourself. And that involves you taking a look around at the things that you're doing with your life 
and the people that you're hanging around with. Because if you're not where you want to be, it will be because of one of those two things. Five books to help improve your health and well-being. Mindset by Carol Dweck. Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. 10% Happier by Dan Harris. The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying by Marie Kondo. Stillness is the Key by Ryan Holiday. How many of these have you read? So we're wrapping up our today's training. I hope you found this session interesting. If you need any further explanation or information you can contact me in the info you see on the slide. I want to declare that neither me, nor ITML, own the videos displayed in this presentation. Thank you very much for your time.